I'm Scott Al Miller. It is the 5th of January, 2023, and this is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today is Friday. Whew, it has been a long week, and I had to really get a lot of work done early because today we are going house hunting with some friends from the channel who have come down. We met with them two nights ago at La Avenida uh, on Wednesday night, and I forgot to mention I, can't, I don't know how I forgot to mention this, this is really cool. While we were at La Avenida having dinner with them, someone else from the channel who has spoken to me in the comments and stuff, we've talked online and I think on Instagram, and uh, he went into La Avenida and ended up sitting at the table right behind us. And while we were talking, he reached back and tapped me on the arm and, uh, and bought me some coffees and said hello. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's not, this is twice now that I've been at La Avenida and been recognized in the restaurant uh, over the last few months and at least the fifth time I think that I've been recognized on that particular street. Uh, so that's, that I've been recognized on the street in a hostel at least twice in La Avenida. It's, that's apparently the place to get recognized if you're a YouTuber in Nicaragua. Really cool, so thank you so much, and to everybody, right? It's so cool to, to have such a following that people actually stop and recognize us. But, so this morning, so we're not going to have a particular topic today because the topic is going to be blended into the day. So I know people like the, the separated topics, but they also like when my day is applicable. I think this is a really good one, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about the pricing. We're not going to show the house. So don't, don't be like, where can I skip ahead, see the house? You'll see why. Um, we are going to show just a tiny bit of it because we did have a little adventure today and that got to show. But I uh, got up this morning and we pretty much had a decently early home showing. I, have, I always have to get up early in the morning and race to get through a bit of work because first thing in the morning is always a disaster at the office. There's always a lot of things going wrong and it takes a few hours for me to get to a point where I could ever consider getting out of the house. Um, so got coffee, did probably uh, two hours of work and then uh, Marcella came up from the beach and met me because she's, she's helping with the home showing and because uh, she does a lot of the translation um, and uh, uh, we did uh, about 10 o'clock because Paul's going to the dentist today. Uh, so he has a 10:30. Uh, we're supposed to meet um, the seller's agents. Remember, we don't work with buyer's agents, but you do have to work with seller's agents if they're the ones representing the house. That is just how the world works. And uh, so we're supposed to meet them at 11 in one of the exclusive communities in the southeast side of Leon. This is uh, inside the city, but on the outskirts. So this is what Nicaraguans consider the suburbs. In America, we would still consider it city, uh, but the outer fringe of the city, here it is considered suburbs, because immediately after this, it goes to fields, which we would all consider fields. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, we had to be down there a bit early. So at about 10.15, Marcel and I got dropped off at the Uno on the south side of town, got some cappuccino and just hung out for a little while uh, and then the people that we were meeting they're driving in from Managua their original goal was to drive all the way to the beach drop their car and come back um, but they did not prepare for the Managua rush hour which takes another one to two hours to get out of the city so they were in no way at the time uh, that they were expecting to be. So they actually got to the Uno about 10 minutes before we needed to go to uh, look at the house. So they knew where we were waiting. They just popped in and surprised us. And then it was so close that we, Marcel and I just walked uh, to where we were going and they drove and uh, we waited on a side street because we didn't know exactly where the house was and our real estate uh, agents that are coming and I know them, um, Freddie and Danielle, uh, they were on their way and actually, actually ended up in a, in a traffic accident, but they were fine, nope, nope, no issues, but it did delay them about 20 minutes. So we got about 20 minutes to hang out. Uh, and of course we know everyone, you know, from La Avenida two nights ago. So we had a nice time, got to tell them about the neighborhood, how it works in the city and all that kind of stuff, how it's related to everything. Uh, we talked a little bit about GoPros, which reminds me, I'm on the GoPro 9 today. My GoPro 11 is busy uploading. I'm actually doing so much on the channel, and I mentioned this already, that I'm going back and forth between the GoPros to keep them busy. So one is charging and uploading while the other is recording. And I'm still playing with the video and I'm really interested one in seeing how the videos compare one to the other uh, when I directly put them on to, to Final Cut Pro. I'm also really, really interested in your guys' feedback. Can you even tell a difference? The uh, GoPro 9, of course, uh, the, the, they have different sensors 
and the GoPro 9 is recording at 4K 30p and the GoPro 11 is recording at 5.3K 30p and then being um, uh, downsized to 4K when we do the final edit. I've heard from people who do a lot of testing that the 5.3K that is then downsampled is the better looking overall process, uh, but the 4Ks are much smaller and easier to edit um, and faster to upload. Uh, and, and I'd really be interested to see if anyone even notices the difference. And if I do it a side by side, will anyone be able to figure out which one is which? I'm very interested in that. But because they do have different sensors, they're not just um, the same type or whatever, they're, they're significantly different sensors. They're different shape sensors, different pixel size sensors, different resolution sensors, different aspect ratio sensors. Um, um, so putting all that together, I really want to know how they l compare and look. And I feel like when I'm looking at the screen that the GoPro 9 is much more contrasty and colorful. And they have the same color settings. So definitely want to look at that. And I need to look at the... Uh, um, uh, exposure compensation settings uh, because I feel like the GoPro 9 is brighter. Anyway, those are things that I've noticed. So our friends had a GoPro 7. We were discussing the battery problems that they have with them. Of course, the GoPro 7 is several years old. My 9 was purchased just before the 10 came out because this is my second 9. And uh, uh, so it's only just pushing two years old, not even yet uh, physically, and the GoPro 7 would be pushing five probably. They've got four batteries that have exploded on them, like they puffed out and you have to really work to get out. While we were there, they tried to pull one out and it ripped the pull-off tab out. It was so swollen. Uh, so that's a real problem with the older GoPros, the batteries. Uh, the GoPro itself, it's the GoPro, right, for the most part. Mine is wearing out for sure. I have a lot of problems with the 9, and I'm going to stop the video here in a second just so we have a save point and let it cool for just a moment. But my GoPro 11 overheats way faster than my 9, um, and it takes longer to upload because the file sizes are bigger. But I like how it manages stuff better. There's just a lot of learning. But the 7, definitely pretty old. Time to get new batteries. If you're going to keep a GoPro for, for more than a year, you, you got to invest in, in current batteries, throw your old ones out as soon as they get flaky. It's just not worth it. But get third-party batteries. You don't have to have the GoPro ones. I actually have, I think, better luck with the third-party ones. So really, I don't think it's a problem at all. Okay, so we went to look at the house, and that's a great place to take a quick break. I am guarantee YouTube is going to show an ad because I'm going to put my hand over the lens. That It detects that and says, ooh, perfect plus spot for an ad. Here's a break. And it's a, I'm going to try putting in a chapter marker. So this is a reminder for Liesl, who is doing all the video edits this week, that we want to attempt a chapter market marker here because while the whole day is one topic, this is where we are going on to the official. Let's tell you about a house that we discovered in Leon. Let's go. All right, so this house that we're looking at today, this is just for a couple. Uh, they don't have any kids. They don't currently have any pets. They just drove down from uh, from up north, from, from North America. So they have been doing a lot of travel. They do have a bit of stuff they need to store, and they are looking for a long-term rental. If it works out, they're okay with short-term because they understand you may have to rent short-term before you find a long-term that you love. Um, but they did have a couple things that they really wanted. They needed two bedrooms for sure. Bigger is better, as is for most of us. There are limits to that, though. Uh, there was an attempt to show them much, 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 much larger by some people uh, that made absolutely no sense. Like, bizarro world, it would be such a problem to maintain a house of such size. So we're looking for a reasonable size house, but two bedrooms minimum, three, four, five, six, those are all, those are all positives. I'm sure seven, eight, nine would start to be like, this is actually extra effort that we don't need to put up with. Uh, and they're really interested in a swimming pool, which it's important to note. It's not that swimming pools are so expensive, but they are a price premium, a serious one. Not because it's so expensive here. It's just because they're so rare. There are parts of the country that have them a lot more often. San Juan del Sur, as an example, they are really common. Here in Leon, whether on the beach or here in the city, they are rare. We are close to the ocean and swimming is not a big cultural thing in Nicaragua for a lot of reasons. Uh, but just important to note, people don't get swimming pools in the way that they do in North America. It's not seen as a big luxury item. It's not like a ooh, house with a pool. People don't really care. Um, so because of that, it's really hard to find houses with pools. It's just not that popular. And when you do find them, they're often indoor pools or in the middle of a colonial that's been converted rather than a place built with what we would consider a big outdoor pool like in North America. We did look for a pool for ourselves. We opted for a place that didn't have one because we can go to the beach. But uh, when we did, the places that we were looking at were above $700 a month in order to get a pool. Now, the pool was enormous. It was beautiful. The house was fantastic. 
it was worth easily 700 or 750 dollars a month so no complaints there but be prepared if having a pool is something that is a really high priority to you you need to really rethink everything you're doing you're op you're going to go from there's lots of options to very very few instantly and i know some people from other channels who are looking to make a quick buck are going to pop in and say there's millions of places with pools you can get them anywhere okay sure ask them to show you all of those in person right ask them to actually take you or a representative of yours in person to see all these available pools and uh, consistently i know people who've done that every time that they actually ask to see them they can't produce the pools they might be able to produce one or two i can produce one or two um, they're either small expensive in a location you don't want that's the thing that happens right oh yeah we have lots of places to show you okay yes one's in swamps full of mosquitoes but do you have any place that someone would actually want to live in oh well you didn't ask for that actually they did that's why we said there weren't any right okay that's my that's my quick rant but that's why you're not going to find very many with pools you're going to find easily uh triple or quadruple the number without pools as an increased ratio compared to what you would in the US. Not three or four without a pool to one with a pool, but three or four times as many without a pool as you would somewhere else. So uh, in all my looking at places, um, I've only ever looked at three or four with pools um, for myself, right? The, it's almost always with how it just works that way. That said, my first house in Nicaragua seven years ago, pool in the living room, loved it. It exists. You just, you're just going to have to really, and the pools will probably not be exactly what you expect just because they're, they're a very big variety. In the United States, they tend to be more uniform. That's a general thing, right? I've said this over the years. The United States and North American market has a tendency towards uniformity in a way that um, other markets, very few markets do, and the Latin American market really doesn't do, and Nicaragua really, really doesn't do. So the extreme uniformity of the US, see my bathroom episode, to the extreme non-uniformity of Nicaragua is big. That, that is a cultural shock uh, if you're coming directly from one to the other. Okay, so this house that we went to look at, really interesting because it's a very, very quiet house located on a back dirt road. So you have to go through a neighborhood, really have to know where you're going. You end up on a quiet street. There's nothing around. All you're doing is looking at side walls, which can be perfect, uh, especially as the front of the house is not really meant to be a view. It's mostly a breezeway. So that was nice. This place had uh, an outdoor garage, so it's a covered area that you pull into, but it's a very formal parking area. It's all tiled and ramped and has a gate for it. So it's very designed to be a parking area, but like many of the more modern houses in Nicaragua, they expect your car to be outside or at least covered but not enclosed. Colonials will enclose, but that's because they have to. That's because the, the structure doesn't allow for anything else. Um, so it had that. That's really nice, and it is good for two vehicles. Uh, perfect for a vehicle with a trailer, where the trailer is going to be stored against the house, and the vehicle comes and goes by the gate. Really nice. Has a front seating area outside. Nothing huge, but very adequate for putting in a cafe table, sitting around and enjoying coffee in the morning with a nice breeze, and seeing whatever's going on with the neighbors, uh, or waiting for people to arrive for a party at your your house whatever nice space out front and plenty of room for gardening with like pots and stuff in the same area really nice walk in small kitchen nothing to write home about but if you're only cooking for a few people completely adequate and it's still within the city so you got Ugo and Pedito's job again probably not something you're gonna cook a lot and and absolutely adequate for normal cooking uh, we tend to cook for a lot of people. It is a high traffic area for us, and my wife does baking on top of all the cooking and stuff that goes on, and my daughter's learning to bake. We need space like you wouldn't believe. Most people do not. This, was, this is really good as a smaller to, to mid-range kitchen for a house of this size. Now, what size is this house? It's a full five bedroom, so that's a lot, right? A five bedroom makes it a large house from a bedroom perspective. And these are full size bedrooms. These are not like the little dinky ones where it's like, okay, yeah, it's five bedrooms, but it's only the size of three. No, this is a full five bedroom house. You really felt the space once you got in. Um, it had an adequate dining room towards the front and a living room towards the front. It also had one of those, what I call garden rooms. They are, we saw one in a video where we did in Fatima where it's like a little room carved out of the side of the house and it has no roof. It does have a grate over it and it's meant for the wind across the top of the house and it sucks the air out so it operates like an air conditioning unit and and really they do a lot to cool houses it is a great design if you find that here in Nicaragua 
um, that's a that's a bonus. You want that during the rainy times. It just rains right in, and it becomes this really cool rain feature in the middle of the house. They're normally sunken. They have drains. They have tile. Uh, you put like plants in there, or you could put like outdoor seating in there and make it like an indoor outdoor space. But it is all about airflow and all about rain, and it's just it's neat and and really helps keep the cost of the house down because you don't have to run air conditioning nearly as much when you have that kind of cooling in the middle of the house. The master bedroom was massive, really really large good bathroom old style um i stepped into it and i'm like yeah like the space is good i'd kind of want to replace all the doors and stuff but that's not a big deal you can totally do that and that's something worth noting about swimming pools if it's something you really desire if you're truly epically must have a swimming pool consider that you one can in most places as long as you can get a yard you can get a uh, plastic above ground pool and you can do pretty nice ones and then you can take it with you when you go most landlords are fine with that so uh so consider that um and also consider if you plan on renting for a long time you can generally work out a deal i don't know if generally is the ter right term you can often work out a deal where you can install an in-ground pool and you may share some of that cost with uh the landlord um like they'll take some money off your rent you pay for it and then you get to live there at a set rent for years or whatever and uh and it works out for everyone right now that does, that, that's a big investment in someone else's property. That kind of stuff is things you would never consider in North America, and here it is absolutely feasible. So um, play around with the numbers and see how much it actually makes sense because a lot of those things make more sense than you would ever guess. Uh, so this really great master, decent master bathroom that just, just really needs a refresh. Everything needs a repaint, but no big deal. There's no landlord that's gonna stop you from repainting and cleaning up. Any Anytime you're, you're improving a property, as long as you're not changing a colonial into something non-colonial, you generally get pretty much like carte blanche here. It, do not worry that that's gonna be a problem. Ask first, of course, and if you're doing something big and expensive, consider you may need to work out a deal to offset some of the cost. Like if you're gonna install air conditioning and plan to leave it, yeah, or if you're gonna put in a water tank like we did, work out a deal so that you don't pay full price for it, uh, and, but maybe you put the money up up front and, and it takes off off the rent over time. Lots of things you can do to work that out. Do that, but consider that you doing the upgrades you want in a rental is absolutely sensible in many cases. Um, the, it then had a uh, Jack and Jill second and third bedroom in the main part of the house across from the master. Really nice. This house has the Nicaragua style breezeway down the one side. This is the post-colonial modern non-air conditioned style that allows for a lot of air movement around the living spaces while being completely isolated from the neighbors. Uh, it's about uh, security and uh, airflow and cooling and low cost and just efficiency. Uh, so all of the bedrooms can open their, I think all of them can open double-sided windows so you have air flow front to back through the house and side to side. Really, really well designed from a cooling perspective. Plus that overhead uh, air across suction up thing. So this is a very, very fresh house. The amount of airflow for a city house, absolutely excellent. And lots of houses do this. It's not a standout in that way, but it was. it's extremely good. Uh, then at the back of those bedrooms, opened into the pool area. The pool area had two bedrooms in the back, not entirely uh, different than, than the one we have here at my house. Um, and in between them had the laundry area. So the back bedroom was quite isolated and the near bedroom touched the house, but was outside the main area. So it's really neat that it's a three bedroom inside and two additional bedrooms outside, perfect for like an in-law apartment or guest rooms and a more central um, main house for the nuclear family. Uh, or however you want to use it, of course, but it's a really good design for those kinds of things. And then the laundry out back, uh, which was nice. Um, and then uh, the pool, not huge, but an, a completely normal, adequate outdoor pool, uh, nice tree covers over it, no water in it, nothing you're gonna rent is gonna have water in it before you get there. Uh, that's, things just don't rent that fast, right? Inventory sits for a really long time these days. They can't maintain pools when no one's living there. Now here's our epic story. While we were looking at the house, while we were looking at the house, an iguana fell out of the tree into the swimming pool. And of course, it's an empty swimming pool and it has no steps. It only has a ladder. The iguana had no way out. And so it was completely panicked. It was toast. I can't believe it survived the fall. That was a really long fall, but it was acting like it was fine other than scared crapless. And uh, so we actually had to take uh, the, the pool scoop and scoop him out and put him back in the tree. He would have been dead had we not been standing there at exactly that moment. 
and been willing to scoop him out of the pool, that would have been a dead iguana in that pool, which would have been really sad because iguanas are wonderful. As I've said all the time, you want iguanas. Anything you can do to encourage iguanas to be anywhere except in your living spaces, uh, you want to do that. This is what happens when an iguana falls into the swimming pool. <laughs> And this is when he falls on my head. <laughs> oh, poor guy. He fell a long way. He fell from this tree into this pool, into the deep end, all on his own. We just happened to be standing here. And remember, in my house in Lago Rio, I have run across iguanas in the living room. Um, they're a little bit surprising, but really, there's nothing that they uh, don't eat that you don't want. They're, they're just good to have around. Good. They're not as good as geckos, but they're good. And uh, I'll just remind that these trees all along here are just full of iguanas all the time. Like this wall behind me, I'll see them running up the wall. All right, so that was that was our adventure, seeing the iguana in the pool and, and having to, to fish him out. That was that was interesting though, and we were all very surprised. Um, and uh, so it went really well, and they actually took the house on the spot. Now, so the question you're gonna ask is, five bedrooms, really big space, with a pool, great cooling, extremely high-end, well, maybe not extremely high-end, reasonably high-end exclusive neighborhood that is highly desirable um, inside the city limits uh, in the area where the utilities are, are cheaper so you're going to pay less if you want to have air conditioning which you don't need but if you do want it and a lot of people will it's going to cost quite a bit less than in El Centro because the power costs go down when you're outside um, and the uh, one of the things they said is this is a, a full water area here in Leon because it's a colonial city the, the center of the city, Labo Rio, Saragossa, El Centro, those regions, the water is not maintained 100% of the time. It goes on and off because it's a really, really, really old system. They can't rip it up and replace it. And once you get outside of the center, the water is continuous. You don't have changes in pressure. You don't have it cut off for certain things or certain times a day. You don't have to worry about that. It's always there. So this is one of those areas. So those all make it a premium because those things are so much better and uh, uh, with, with the parking and the good outside gate and uh, on, on just a six month lease, so it's not a long term, what would you expect this to cost? And probably we could have negotiated down a tiny bit, but it really was a good price. In all the stuff I've looked at, I agree that this price was excellent. And at five really large bedrooms with a pool, great design, great neighborhood, $500 a month on a six month. And standard leases, from what I know, um, it's going to be uh, one month deposit and your first month up front. And that's so if you're going to do a 500, that'll be a thousand dollars up front and you are good to move in generally immediately, right? Next day or whatever. Most properties sit idle for months, if not years. And so they're anxious to get someone in and they're certainly not going to hold you up for whatever reason. Also be prepared. Most places you will look at are going to be dirty. They have not cleaned them because people look once in a while. They don't have time to clean them before you come and they certainly can't afford to clean before everyone because only so many people who look end up purchasing or renting or whatever. So you really need to be prepared that they're going to be dirty, but they will clean them before you move in. And in some cases, they'll do a lot of repairs before you move in. You just, you just don't know. Uh, so that was the house. That was amazing. Um, it, it really was. It was a great showing. I'm so jealous. I love that house. I mean, I really love my house. I'm not jealous in that way, but it is a excellent house at an excellent price. Um, really a winner. And um, uh, so then we left and we're like, okay, we actually have a lot of logistics to do because Marcella and the real estate agents and the couple that got the house need to go deal with that stuff. So, and I needed to get back to work because there was stuff going on at work and they were texting me and I, I was needed. So I, they all packed into a car and went to deal with that stuff for the rest of the day. Uh, and I didn't see them again uh, that day. I had to get back to the office. So I tried to get a taxi and I actually had a really frustrating time getting a taxi. And this is, so, Taxis here in Leon are generally pretty good compared to most places. And there was a conversation on uh, the, in the threads down below recently where we talked a little bit about taxis and Uber and that stuff. Here in Nicaragua, we don't have Uber, we don't have Lyft. We have InDriver, but only in Managua. If you're in Managua, do not get in a taxi, use InDriver. It will call a taxi, but that taxi will then have some safety controls. If you get in a taxi that isn't through InDriver, you are at so much risk because there's just, there's just so many things. Okay, the camera's having a problem. We're gonna stop the video and be right back. All right, 
don't get into a normal taxi um, in Managua because there, there's no way to know if it's an official taxi. There's no way to know if it's legal. There's no way to know uh, who they are or where they're going or what they should charge you. With in-driver, all that's protected against, and it's still a taxi, so do that. Here in Leon, generally taxis are safe, not 100% of the time, but generally. We have had recently, um, this is very recent, and this is the first time we've heard of anything like this in the country ever in the seven years that I've been here, uh, in and out of here, but we actually had a taxi driver murder or someone here in Leon. It's someone that we know, um, not not like a friend of ours. It's someone like we've seen, um, and it was uh, the the husband was a target. He managed to escape. The wife was with him because the wife had seen the people who were trying to rob them. They killed her, and um, and that was all because it was a taxi. Had it been an Uber, that I mean, bad people can be in an Uber, but there would have been so many safety things. So the degree to which, when I say taxis are dangerous, I really mean it because. All the things like they're legal, they're licensed, none of that provides safety, right? Anyone with a few, few dollars can go get that stuff. Um, that just means they're paying their taxes. Uh, the, the risks with a taxi is there's no GPS on it, right? The word taxi means it's risky, right? It's, it's, if something's called a taxi, you need to really think twice. In some places, you don't have an option. Here in Leon, you don't have an option. Taxis are what there are, but be aware, there's no GPS on that. Nobody knows who you, where you are. No one knows who they picked up. No one knows what you're supposed to pay until you get somewhere and then they tell you what you're going to pay and you're just stuck, right? So it's really dangerous anywhere in the world dealing with taxis. Um, I've never heard in real life of someone with like an Uber or something getting actually really ripped off. Um, I've, we've had a lot of problems with them not showing up and canceling on us, but I've never heard of someone being extorted or taken somewhere they're not supposed to go. Of course, there's horror stories about it, but they're, you know, 0.1% of how much that happens with a taxi. It's just Uber's a big company, so everybody talks about it. Taxis just kill people every day and no one cares anymore. It's just part of the danger of getting into a taxi. You might as well just jump into a dumpster with a trailer with a machete and hope they don't kill you. It's a crazy process. I can't believe that taxis are legal anywhere and I can't believe any municipality um, doesn't outlaw them, let alone actually goes out and supports them. It's a terrible, terrible system. Um, and, and people need, I really truly believe that governments need to be held accountable for allowing taxis at this stage in the game. 50 years ago, it's what we had to work with. Today, there's no excuse absolutely zero for taxis existing. Um, but here in Leon, you're stuck, right? And almost always you're good because all the taxi drivers know each other and they, they're not gonna let it get too bad, except it, it did, right, just recently. So it is risky. And um, I had called our normal taxi driver and said, I need, a, I need a ride. He, of course, as always, his car was in getting a car wash, which annoys the heck out of me. Like, I need to be picked up. I don't care if your car is clean. That is such bad customer service because um, it's a constant thing. It's not like, oh, it happened once. It's 20 times. This is literally, it's insane. So he sent one of his guys, right? Well, of course, I don't know this guy. And he texts me on WhatsApp and sends me his, you know, hi, this is your taxi driver or whatever. But I have no way to identify him. I just have his name, right? I'm like, okay. And I send him my location on WhatsApp. So he knows exactly where I am and it's live. So if I walk, which I did, I walked just a little bit so that I could be easier to pick up and, and he could see me. And he responded, okay, I've arrived. Ya llego. And that doesn't mean I'm arriving. It doesn't mean I'm about to arrive. It means I have already arrived. Ya yeah, is already. So as he texted that, a taxi had pulled up seconds before, right to where I was. I mean, within two car lengths of where I was standing. And he texted, I have arrived. It was the only car on the street. It then pulled up next to me. I said, Kevin? He said, yes. So I got in the taxi. I made it 10 minutes away before I got texted, where are you? I said, are you serious? 10 minutes after you said you arrived and you were watching my location, you know I'm across the city now, right? It, this is a serious problem. Every taxi we know, except Ricardo, Ricardo doesn't do this. Every other taxi lies about where they are. They say, oh, I'm already on my way. Well, they're 10 minutes away. 30 minutes later, they're not there. Clearly, they were not on their way. Um, I've already arrived. Actually, they're just leaving, right? Like, they will say anything to delay because you'll just grab another taxi if they, if they don't do that. And so it's, that becomes really dangerous because you have very little ability in many cases to identify if you're in the right taxi. So this taxi, knowing that he picks someone up under false pretenses, 
then double charged me for the ride. And what am I going to do about it? Right? I had arranged how much it would cost ahead of time because I was using my normal taxi service. So it may vary a little bit, but we have like a deal, right? He's definitely not going to screw me over on price. And this guy knew he would never see me again and had lied about who he was, pretended he was my ride, and now it was, it was his one chance to make an extra couple bucks. Was it a huge deal? No, he screwed me out of like three extra dollars, right? It's not the end of the world. That's not the big deal. It is a big deal to have that happen on a regular basis that you're trusting your, your rides, your taxis, and they can't be trusted. Um, this is weird that this coincides with someone saying you should always take taxis because it's safe. That's, I, don't, I don't understand that logic. It is, they're so dangerous. So unfathomably dangerous. I cannot believe they're legal and that any person would be willing to take them. Um, <laughs> under, under normal circumstances. I only take ones that I know. And I know taxis that I really like. I call them every time. I don't take random taxis normally. I've got several. I take Ricardo. I take Leo. I take Claudio. And I know, I know they're going to show up when they say, I know, well, Leo will send someone and then I have no idea. But the others, they're always going to show up when they say if they're available and get me where I need to go and the price is going to be what I expect. Um, and uh, uh, but the real danger here is that I was in the car with an unknown person who now knows where my house is, who now uh, uh, knows that I'm angry, who knows that he scammed me, who uh, could have been anybody. He could have been there to rob me, right? That's, I don't know that he's not. Um, and, and no one knew what taxi I was in. And I didn't know what taxi I was in because I was told it was a different taxi. So this is a really dangerous situation that my taxi driver, my normal driver, put me into uh, because he sent out a person who was being irresponsible and, and dishonest, right? And so I'm, I'm quite upset about this. Um, and I don't know when I'm going to be using that, that taxi service again um, because uh, uh, that, was, that was really, really really un, uncalled for. Um, so I was angry about that. That was a big part of my day. Um, but I think the taxi thing is a big topic. It's, it's really important for travelers to understand how much risk taxis are. I don't know if I've taken more than, it must be one out of three taxis that I've taken outside of like taking my known taxis around Leon. Of times that I've taken taxis around the world, almost always I've been taken somewhere I wasn't supposed to go, uh, charged far more than agreed to, um, extorted for something. Uh, Paul had a time that he took a taxi and because they use addresses instead of GPS, the taxi didn't mean to screw him over, but it took him to the right address in the wrong location, which they would have known had they been Uber or Lyft, it would have made sure it was the right location. The taxi took them to an address that was duplicated, duplicated in the city. Uh, they got into an altercation. The police had to come. The police apologized and said it was a municipal problem. It was a mistake of the government for having made the same address twice in the city and that it wasn't the taxi's fault because he didn't know. It wasn't Paul's fault because he didn't know. Both of them felt that the other one was screwing them over and it was really just the government. So the police were fantastic in that case in Colombia, but that's a real danger. And again, it's that you allow a blind taxi system like that creates those dangers. There's no excuse for that today. Um, uh, then uh, spent the afternoon working again. I was really, really busy uh, with everything and it's Friday night. So uh, that, was, that was pretty much our day in the evening. Um, we just hung out. It was time, time to relax around the house after an adventurous day of looking at houses and dealing with taxis and doing an awful lot of work. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be heading to the beach. I'm meeting some people out there, people from the channel. Uh, I'm going to get to see the, the hotel for the first time uh, again in a week, almost. And uh, uh, we're going to go out tomorrow night. So um, everyone went out tonight. I did not. I stayed home because I had a lot to do. I'm exhausted and uh, it, I'm going to come over and say hi to Clive who is hanging out. He hears my voice. I was trying to figure out where I am. Are you hanging out in the garden, little boy? And uh, yeah, thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. Put your comments below. Ask any questions. Uh, what are your experiences? Have you, has anyone actually had something dangerous happen with Uber or Lyft? I want to know because in real life, I have no experience with something bad happening other than them not picking me up uh, or not being available. And I have so many times the taxis aren't available, that same difference, right? Um, and uh, if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee. That, uh, that goes directly to me. It makes an absolutely huge difference uh, to being able to make this channel and keep things going. Uh, and of course, share on social media. Tell your friends about the show. And I will see all of you from Nicaragua tomorrow.